What is the most commonly used material on Earth? It's found virtually everywhere. With it, we can cross deep ravines. We can scale high mountains. It can span huge distances. It connects us. It encloses us. It is extremely versatile. It's inert. It's strong. We've been using it for thousands of years. And yet demand isn't waning. Without it, the world would be totally changed. It has provided us with the very building blocks of modern life. We can sit on it, polish and walk on it, even skateboard on it. It's been revolutionary in the past. It's incredibly versatile in the present. But does it have a future? The world would be a very different place without the great invention, concrete. In today's world, seven out of 10 people live in a home made of concrete. Globally, we're producing the equivalent of half a million tons of concrete for every person on the planet per year. It's been used to create some of the world's most impressive megastructures. Like this, the Three Gorges Dam, spanning the Yangtze River in Hubei Province, China, is the world's largest power station. With such gargantuan construction projects and over 1.4 billion people to house, it's no surprise that China is the biggest market for this ubiquitous commodity that has proved to be so resilient. China also manufactures significantly more cement than any other country, nearly 2.4 billion metric tons in 2018. Concrete is a material that's incredibly tough and fantastic for building. It's an incredibly versatile material that we put to great use, and that's why it is great. Across the globe, this wonder material is used for a staggering number of projects. And every single day, the equivalent of 6.4 million truckloads of concrete are put to new use. But most surprising of all, is how long concrete has actually been around. Archaeologists have found evidence of crude Stone Age concrete in the Middle East in fire pits. The fires calcined or heated the surrounding limestone rock, which inadvertently created lime. Mixed with water, it hardened spectacularly. And word spread. In Europe, there's evidence that Stone Age hunters and fishermen mixed red lime, sand, gravel, and water to construct solid floors for their huts. Concrete that more resembles the material we use today was first used by the Egyptians. They mastered their construction techniques over centuries. They evolved over time to then develop the concrete as we know it. They would have mud and straw, and then they would join it with some gypsum and lime, and then that would make brickwork. Some of that is in the pyramid today, so it's lasted a very long time. This great invention's versatility seems endless, yet it is a simple combination of only a few ingredients. Concrete is made out of water, aggregates such as gravel, rocks, or ballast, and cement. And cement acts as the binding agent between all of those ingredients. The story of concrete cannot be told without the story of cement. The different ways of making the cement glue to hold the aggregates together is the vital aspect of concrete. It's the development of better and better cement that has allowed us to use concrete in the multitude of ways we have. It's helped answer a problem present since we existed, a basic requirement of all living creatures, the need for protection and shelter. 
For thousands of years, human beings have sought to find ways of holding building materials together to give us better security and shelter within four walls. Building solid walls was an effective solution in protecting communities from invasion, such as the Great Wall of China. Cement-like materials were used in its construction, which began around 2,700 years ago. Walls built with readily available cement are used as much in modern times as in history to separate communities in times of crisis, like this one in Northern Ireland. In 1961, a stark concrete wall was built to separate East and West Germany. The German Democratic Republic wanted to stop the exodus of citizens moving over to West Germany. Construction began on a wall of concrete slabs and posts to literally stop refugees in their tracks and keep them in the east. The wall was eventually breached in 1989 and finally removed. A once divided Germany was made whole again. Walls of concrete are still created as lines of division even now. Whether in Israel, separating the Israeli from the Palestinian communities, or in the USA, where the administration wants to keep economic migrants from Mexico crossing into America. No matter the construction challenge, concrete has been the go-to quick solution thanks to discoveries made 2,000 years ago. It was the Greeks, then the Romans, who really unlocked the secrets of cement. On the beautiful volcanic island of Santorini, the Greeks discovered a way of producing a cement mix that would harden when water was added. We know this now as hydraulic cement. The key ingredient was pozzolana, which is a type of volcanic ash. When combined with lime and water, it would undergo a chemical reaction and harden. The particular mineral components, including pumicite, contained in the ash, gave it exceptional strength. It was the construction of the Roman Empire that would truly begin to harness the potential of the Pozzolana-based hydraulic cement. It's the Romans, really, who establish concrete making as we understand it. And that's because they learn from others, but they also systematize it, they also record it. And so um, what one finds are texts which are going to be returned to again and again, produced by the Romans, explaining how concrete is produced. Famously, the Emperor Augustus said that he found Rome in brick and left it in marble might as easily have said that he found it in brick and left it in concrete, because that was also part of his legacy. The Romans embarked on huge civil and military building projects. Roman cement could withstand seawater, enabling them to also produce great maritime construction projects. The ruins of Caesarea on Israel's Mediterranean coast demonstrate the ingenuity and durability of their construction techniques. Today, stones are still bound together by cement after centuries of battering by the weather and sea. And as the Roman Empire grew ever larger, construction projects followed suit. And Pozzolana cement from the Pozzuoli area near Mount Vesuvius was used in some truly staggering early Roman engineering projects. For example, the long and straight Appian Way connected Rome with southern Italy. Heavy stone blocks were cemented together with a lime-based mortar. Parts of the road were lined with monuments, and great viaducts were built along the way, pioneering examples of Roman engineering. This was a truly golden era of concrete construction. 
So the Romans are using concrete uh, for patching up buildings, for binding buildings together. They're also using concrete for massive public works. Concrete's also used for some of the great public buildings of Rome. One of the monumental examples of Roman architecture is the Colosseum, built of stone bound together with concrete. It's still standing in central Rome after 2,000 years, thanks to the longevity of Roman concrete. The Colosseum remains the world's largest amphitheater ever attempted, although the historical details provide less to celebrate. It was built with the bare hands of tens of thousands of slaves. As well as big sporting events and games, it was also used for a more brutal and gory purpose, the showcase for gladiators to demonstrate their strength in front of a baying crowd of many thousands. They would fight to the death of one or the other for the pleasure of the spectators. But perhaps the most impressive of all Roman concrete triumphs is the extraordinary Pantheon, one of the best preserved ancient buildings in the world. Its dome, still the largest unsupported dome in the world, is made entirely of concrete, a structure that would simply never be attempted today because of our engineering codes of practice. Scientists have concluded that its strength and longevity are down to the volcanic ash they found in the mortar, the Pozzolana. The Romans took their construction secret with them to their graves, leaving us almost 2,000 years later to figure out the mystery ingredient. The concrete civilization of Rome comes to an end with the fall of the Roman Empire. We see, you know, not just the loss of the knowledge of how to build concrete, we see the loss of all sorts of techniques, and in particularly backward places like, like England, they even lose the capacity to make ceramics. So what you end up with is the loss of a technology and a capacity to build big public buildings using concrete that's not going to be rediscovered for hundreds of years there would be a dark age for concrete for well over a thousand years. This extraordinary Roman invention, and more crucially how to make it, was simply forgotten. By the Middle Ages, construction of homes for ordinary peasant folk in many parts of Europe was of poor quality. This Scandinavian village reconstruction shows the traditional raw building materials, wood, straw, and mud. But these homes were highly flammable, prone to rot, and had no foundations. We needed to rediscover Roman concrete, so much stronger than mud, to bind building materials together and make them tougher, more weatherproof, and durable. The revival began in the construction of something seemingly insignificant. A lighthouse. On a treacherous, rocky outcrop off the south coast of England, a lighthouse was needed to withstand the rigors of crashing waves. Civil engineer John Smeaton was inspired by the Romans' pozzolana made from volcanic ash. He used a strong powdered limestone which set hard when mixed with water. It's known as hydraulic lime. Smeaton was riding high. He discovered the first ever waterproof concrete since the Roman times. Unlike the Romans, he designed his concrete without using volcanic ash. He used hydraulic lime. And the Smeaton Lighthouse was a perfect project to test it. The trick was that the concrete could hold fast in rough, wet conditions. News of the humble lighthouse modeling Smeaton's new concrete mix traveled around the world. The success of Smeaton's tower, the fact that you could use concrete to construct these great public buildings, helps to cement, as it were, an arms race between you know, Britain and France and between other European powers, all of them competing to try and be the first with this great new technology. 
Nevertheless, engineers and architects were skeptical without further improvements. At that point, they felt it wasn't good enough to create new, prestigious buildings with. It was a fear of the unknown and the unproven. Architects of the day were hesitant to adopt using concrete. They thought it was a reason to allow for shoddy workmanship. At the time, they were dismissive of all the new materials, such as glass panels, steel, and of course, concrete. They wanted to stick to a traditionalist method of construction, most prestigiously being stone. But stone was expensive, especially a particular variety, Portland stone, that 18th century London had been built from. It's a Jurassic period limestone found in southern England, so not particularly convenient for builders further afield. What if there could be a concrete made to look like Portland stone that could be produced anywhere in the world? It would mean we didn't just have a great looking mortar, but we could make building blocks from the concrete which would look as good as expensive, handsome Portland stone, but without the cost. It took a lot of trial and error to find the right combination of finely ground limestone and clay to match the real thing. Finally, the turning point, an artificial stone using what became known as Portland cement. The British are, I think, the leaders in this, and they're the leaders in this because they are also leading in the Industrial Revolution. There is money to do this, there's demand to do this. The British are building vast docks. They are building huge, great public works. They are already engaged in the process of canalizing the country, of producing railways eventually. All of these things drive the demand for new and better building materials. And Portland cement is one of those new and better building materials. The invention of Portland cement was a huge breakthrough in concrete technology. In fact, it's now the most widely used manufactured material at around 3.5 billion tons each year. Portland cement forms the basic mix of concrete used throughout the world. Cement gives us amazing possibilities, and it's not just buildings and roads. There are many exciting applications in interior design. Concrete's surface can be polished to give it a high shine. It can be treated and celebrated. Concrete is not just a straight up building material or a glue for things. A lot of people actually find it aesthetically pleasing. You can make it really quite nice, you know, with buffing it up and shining it and things like that. And also it's used in a lot of artwork as well. So not only is it, is it a building material that has great uses, but it's actually sort of pervaded many other sectors. You can stain it like this or add textured patterns to replicate wood, for example or just spray it a different color. You can install furniture made from concrete. Sleek, comfortable finishes make you forget the hardness and rigidity of the static structure you're sitting on. And you can chop your vegetables on a polished concrete worktop if you like. It can be a remarkably resilient design feature in a modern kitchen. What I love about concrete is concrete doesn't have to look the same all the time. Concrete can have so many various finishes. I mean, the possibilities are endless with the finishes you can achieve with concrete. From decoration to record breaking, concrete can stretch our engineering capabilities, like building tunnels. At 35 kilometers long, this is the longest undersea railway tunnel in the world and the largest engineering project ever undertaken anywhere, ever. Filmed during its construction in the late 1980s, it connects mainland Europe to the main island of Britain. It's a modern marvel, recognized as one of the seven wonders of the modern world, and it's built of concrete and steel. The tunnels were lined with tailor-made rings made from a high-intensity concrete, designed to last for 120 years. We're good at building tunnels, 
and we're good at digging other holes to harvest and exploit our natural resources. None more so than by repurposing the very ground we walk on. In massive quarries like this one in Switzerland, aggregate is systematically gouged out of the ground and then processed, ready for use in construction. So exactly how do you make concrete to get that impressive Portland stone look? Much like preparing a simple cake mix, the key to making good concrete is using the correct proportions of each ingredient. But the method itself is straightforward. First, mix the Portland cement and water to make a paste. A chemical reaction called hydration will occur and lots of microscopic crystals will form. Next, add your aggregate, either fine like sand to make a smooth paste for mortar in a building or coarse, which can prove cheaper to use. Whatever the grade of aggregate, make sure that it is completely coated with the paste. Finally, ensure that the magic ingredient, air, is allowed in as you mix. Air makes the mix easier to work with and improves the concrete's ability to withstand both freezing and thawing. No baking required. Use straight away and it will set within a few hours. Perfect. It seemed that concrete was never going to be fit for the kinds of purposes we had in mind. As well as changing the color, which was achieved with Portland cement, concrete had to be improved to make it more reliable structurally. But how could concrete be made stronger? Building in concrete had to change. We had to have confidence in our structures that they would stay strong and last. The answer lay in the developments that came with the Industrial Revolution. So concrete's not the only new building material of the 19th century. Steel is being produced in industrial qualities. Plate glass is being produced in hitherto unimaginable quantities. And architects and engineers are actually much more interested in those two new sorts of uh, building materials. In France, concrete construction was to take its largest step forward for centuries. But this time, it would not be a world-renowned engineer to make the breakthrough. It was a French gardener who simply wanted stronger flower pots. And he turned to the other newly available commodity, steel, to provide the strength he was looking for. So really, the, the, the important change is the introduction of steel reinforcing rods through the concrete. I mean, what that does is to transform the nature of concrete. It makes it stronger. It means you can build higher, you can build bigger, you can build quicker. In every way, it, it revolutionizes concrete, and as a result, revolutionizes building uh, throughout the world. Inserting the steel rods into the concrete before it's set was genius. Crucially, this reinforcement made the difference between trust and mistrust of concrete. Steel would give it the tensile strength and the concrete would give it the compressive strength. Other engineers started to see the benefit of this and they started exploring, expanding the technique to railway and to bridges. And so concrete becomes, in the minds of some, the modern material and the basis for modern architecture for centuries to come. What followed at the beginning of the 20th century was nothing short of a concrete building gold rush, evidenced in these great American icons built at that time. Industrialization had already come to cement production as well as to steel, so that both were readily available and at scale. This meant we could build quantity as well as quality in concrete. But it took a cataclysmic event to take concrete to the next level. The San Francisco earthquake of 1906 killed thousands of residents. It destroyed a staggering 80% of the city. 500 city blocks were wiped out. 
a few reinforced concrete buildings survived, indicating that if homes had been built of concrete instead of wood, the devastation would not have been so great. Instead, buildings went up in flames. The damage was valued at $8.2 billion in today's money. Rebuilding better, stronger, and fast was the number one priority, and concrete was a major player. Among the American engineers who grasped that notion of building quickly and strong was a prolific inventor not known for architecture. Thomas Alva Edison was possibly best known for world-changing inventions like the incandescent light bulb. He became obsessed with the possibilities that came with concrete, even founding his own Edison Portland Cement Company. Concrete looks to Edison and to some other people as the single best way of producing factory-like building, of mass-producing architecture, using the properties of concrete to provide social housing, schools, roads, cars, and indeed almost everything you find within a home. Thomas Edison was a thought leader of the time. He wanted to see if he could create everything in concrete. Now imagine that. Everything. Housing. Everything inside your house. Even your fridge out of concrete. Edison's vision was to create indestructible but affordable homes like the model he's standing next to. But others designed for mass production weren't quite what people were looking for. They were deemed ugly. Edison was full of great ideas, but this one needed rethinking. Elsewhere in Europe, one thing that was successful was the road system. At the end of the 19th century, the French were leading the way, experimenting with non-reinforced concrete roads. But as building work with reinforced concrete began, it was evident that the infrastructure connecting towns and cities also needed reinforcing. At roughly the same time as this new road building craze was happening, a great friend of Edison, a man named Henry Ford, produced his first Model T car, and the American road network began a fundamental transformation. Edison jumped on this construction bandwagon too and tried his hand at road building for his friend Ford's cars to run on. Edison's interest in assembly line concrete house building was very like the interest of his friend Ford in producing the Model T in these Fordist assembly lines. And they are friends, and they have mutual interests, and this idea of mass production is in the air. And so what's happening is that at the same time that Ford is producing the people's car and Edison is trying to produce these concrete people's houses, all these cars are being produced. The houses aren't, but the cars do need something to run on. And so concrete roads provide one answer to how the Model T is going to get about. American road building escalated quickly alongside what became a national passion for cars. The US can now boast the largest network in the world with roughly 6.6 .6 million kilometers of roads, followed by China and India, where research suggests that for long-lasting roads, concrete is the solution. There was another concrete construction boom in 1930s America, despite the Great Depression. U.S. federal buildings that were due to be built with stone were instead built in concrete. And it was the beginning of engineering some truly astonishing concrete creations. The staggering scale of building the Hoover Dam, for example, which demanded an incredible infrastructure to support it not least the planning and building of Boulder City. The land was nothing but desert in Nevada before construction began of a brand new town 
in an experimental style that had never been tried before, largely in concrete. The engineers and surveyors were housed first as they prepared for the construction of the dam. Then, a train station was created. The workers' accommodation was next. Thousands of modest homes plus all the infrastructure for a town. Public buildings, utilities, schools, a hospital, and churches. Within a year, a town of 5,000 inhabitants was established. Streets and streets of houses where everyone who lived there worked on the dam in some capacity. The dam was providing much needed jobs to the American workforce at a time when unemployment was high because of the economic depression. And it rose so quickly out of the desert thanks to the speed with which concrete could be mixed and used. Every component of the construction of the dam was on an epic scale. This one project required the same quantity of concrete as a full-sized highway across the United States, 4,800 kilometers long. More than five million barrels of Portland cement went into the dam. The project, initially named Boulder Dam, harnessed the power of the Colorado River with the aim of creating enough electricity to supply the whole population of California. Today, it provides electricity to 1.3 million people living in three states and remains one of America's biggest power plants. Providing housing on a mega scale and fast, like they had to in Boulder City, is still a challenge in the 21st century. Refugee crises like the one that caused this camp to be built in Turkey mean many thousands of people have to be given shelter quickly. Several camps in this area house tens of thousands of refugees from the conflict in Syria. Now, there is a quick, robust solution to providing them with temporary homes. Technology has been developed that allows concrete shelters to be constructed in ultra-quick time. A team in the UK have come up with this. It's like an inflatable home, except that as well as air, you add water. The concrete sets to provide a solid, weatherproof refuge. Concrete canvas is a fabric that's filled with a dry concrete powder with a waterproof PVC membrane on the rear surface. And we developed the material to get another invention that we had to work, and these are called concrete canvas shelters. These are rapidly deployable, inflatable concrete structures for disaster relief. This idea sparked another, which could revolutionize the construction industry, thanks to its simple application. Concrete on a roll, which can be laid as a ditch lining, for example. It's flexible before use. It's then laid over whatever surface you want to cover in concrete, typically a soil structure. Once in place, it's sprayed with water. That hydrates the cement component. And in 24 hours, the concrete sets, and you have a hard, fiber-reinforced concrete layer. It's said to be 10 times quicker than conventional concrete mixing, laying, and setting. Speedy solutions are in demand to enable construction in times of crisis, such as even a housing crisis. But what came along to alleviate European post-war homelessness wasn't to everyone's taste. Ever since we've had buildings made of concrete in the modern era, Critics and fans have been divided. But one movement caused more of a rift than most. Brutalism. And the man behind it was known as Le Corbusier. He was a tour de force and a leader of a movement opening other architects and the public's eyes to a different way of using and seeing concrete. They start to use concrete because they believe it's beautiful. They start to use concrete because they believe 
that you should show your building is concrete. Concrete was the material of the future, a sign of forward-thinking architecture in both the capitalist West and communist East. It would be a true golden age of unashamed concrete construction. Architects were celebrating the material, not hiding its flaws. Le Corbusier's L'Unité d'Habitation in Marseille shows the simplicity and functionality he had in mind. Brutalist buildings, characterized by their monolithic appearance and rigid geometric style, were made with large-scale use of poured concrete. With a huge population boom around the globe, this brutalist architecture lent itself to building for the masses. Brutalist buildings fell out of fashion in the 1980s and were vilified by many for decades to come. But now they are enjoying a renaissance and instead of being threatened with demolition, brutalist buildings are being celebrated. However, the world's passion for concrete construction resulted in a lack of green space, which led to the description of our cities as concrete jungles. An ironic term, given that concrete is now thought of as a large contributory factor to our climate change issues and ever-rising CO2 levels in Earth's atmosphere. The global cement industry was said to be responsible for between 4 and 8 percent of the world's carbon dioxide emissions in 2019. In fact, it's been suggested that if the cement industry were a country, it would be the third biggest emitter of CO2 in the world behind China and the USA. Manufacturing concrete typically generates a lot of CO2, and we don't need any more greenhouse gases emitted. So though there is a lot of negative press about concrete in terms of its embodied carbon and kind of the CO2 involved in the production and use of concrete, it's no worse than many other materials. I think the problem we often find with concrete is we use it in such huge quantities that it ends up scaling up to being quite significant. Production of cement has quadrupled globally in the last 30 years. In China, production is 12 times more than it was in 1990. We look at cities today and a lot of it is built on concrete. That, that may be changing, or at least the way that we make that concrete might be changing because cities are going to become smarter. We're going to be having more technology built into our cities, um, but we also need to be using more green technology, making them more sustainable so that they don't have such an environmental impact. And that is going to affect how we make cities in the future. Green design ideas may be part of the answer. Shanghai's 1,000 Trees construction project is injecting some missing greenery and oxygen to this part of the pollution-choked city and the 12th most polluted country in the world air quality index in 2018. It's described as a tree-lined mountain with a plantation of indigenous trees hugging every level of the unusual design. Hundreds of concrete columns were used to distribute the weight of the trees to the ground. Living walls bring carbon-consuming plants and trees into our urban spaces. The downside is the support required in terms of planting, watering, and pruning of the vegetation. So much research is being done on concrete to try and reduce carbon dioxide emissions. It's of real interest right now. Concrete development is looking to go further than simply greening up. Bioconcrete is being developed that will grow plants from pores on its surface. These new systems do away with the need for soil or irrigation. This kind of technology could literally change the way we look at concrete in years to come, making our view of the built environment greener, as well as improving air quality. Concrete has already allowed architects to design some extraordinary buildings with wonderfully flowing lines. The Sydney Opera House, with its precast concrete shells, 
is a magnificent example of the flexibility concrete can provide. In its harbor home, they look like sails filled by the wind, making it one of the most iconic buildings in the world. The execution of this original design was achieved using early computer technology. Today and in the future, that technology will enable more modeling and pre-planning to cover every eventuality. 3D printing is one of the ways forward, automating many of the processes. This is claimed to be Europe's first 3D printed building. The BOD, an acronym for Building On Demand, was installed in Denmark in 2017. It doesn't have any straight walls, proving that 3D printing gives designers fantastic versatility without incurring huge costs. It took two months from start to finish, but the designers say they've been able to speed that up to three days. These new innovations in concrete are already changing the way we build, perhaps even fueling our appetite for this brilliant invention. Concrete's reputation is a sturdy, solid, dependable one. Some buildings around the world have been built in concrete to exude those qualities, their very being meant to inspire confidence. Power stations, for example. Massive, important-looking steam towers stand out on the skyline as familiar man-made landmarks reminding us of where our electricity is being produced. When we use concrete for nuclear power stations, I think there's almost some public confidence, public perception of confidence when you see a concrete structure. It's durable. It's going to last the test of time. I'm safe. So sometimes I think the power of concrete isn't just its material qualities. It's actually the emotional associations that we as human beings have put on concrete. Concrete makes us feel safe. But concrete is not strong enough to save us from a catastrophic disaster like this one. Chernobyl, 1986. Explosions in one of the reactors made it the world's worst nuclear accident. The subsequent fire burned for 10 days, releasing a large amount of radiation into the atmosphere. 2,600 square kilometers in Ukraine and Belarus will be contaminated by radioactivity for at least the next 24,000 years. To try and lock in the remaining radioactive materials, a shell was rapidly constructed using 400 cubic meters of concrete. But it wasn't sealed properly. Years later, radiation levels outside were rising and the structure was in danger of collapsing. Work began by laying new foundations with 20,000 cubic meters of concrete ready to support a tailor-made casing designed to seal within it the damaged plant and the remaining radioactive material. In an unprecedented operation in 2016, this giant steel shell called the New Safe Confinement was rolled into position. It's the world's largest movable object, measuring 257 meters long by 109 meters high, and it's strong enough to tolerate a temperature range between minus 43 and plus 45 degrees Celsius, as well as tornadoes and earthquakes. It's designed to last for 100 years, by which time it's hoped a longer lasting solution will have been found. In the meantime, this massive sarcophagus is keeping us safe from Chernobyl's toxic radioactive ruins. When we build nuclear power plants today, safety is absolutely paramount. Three million tons of concrete will be used in one of Europe's biggest infrastructure projects to supply millions with low carbon electricity. But some countries shun nuclear power, opting for planet-friendly alternatives Concrete foundations support wind turbines and hydroelectric installations. It also has a playful side.
providing a great surface for skateboarding. Invented in the 1950s by Californian surfers wanting to surf concrete. These days, there's a wealth of urban explorers and adrenaline junkies reveling in the concrete playgrounds of our towns and cities. If you're a skateboarder, you want a concrete jungle. You want the mayhem of the smooth concrete surfaces to bomb down on. They're fantastic to have that fun experience on. So too, in the land of movies, celebrities can have fun taking part in an iconic celebration of the stars, cast in concrete. The story goes that the owner of the Chinese theater in Los Angeles accidentally stood in wet concrete during its 1927 construction, sparking the idea for celebrities to do the same. More than 200 Hollywood greats have planted their hand and footprints so far. Will the Hollywood handprints stand the test of time? Will they have the same enduring quality of the early Roman concrete used 2,000 years ago? As concrete is the second most widely used substance on Earth after water, its lasting legacy will surely endure. The thing with concrete and indeed steel is that they, are, they have massively scaled. They're industries that can handle the amount of building that we do, and we do a lot of building. And as we have more and more people joining us, you know, stabilizing at about 11 billion of us by the end of the century, they're going to need somewhere to live. So I think we're not going to see concrete or steel replaced by anything soon just because of the supply side of it. You can come up with a new material or whatever, but you just don't have enough of it to handle the amount of demand. Concrete has dictated the way we build. It frames our existence and has provided solutions to seemingly impossible problems. Concrete is, is a great invention because it's just such a versatile material. It has led to the building of, of cities and buildings that we really need to use. Um, it's allowed cities to thrive, um, and also it, it's incredibly useful in, in other things. Do I love concrete? I think I do. I really think I do. It's created the countries we live in all around the world. It's created a society that we all have now, where we have great roads, great infrastructure, big bridges, railways. Without concrete, we wouldn't be here today, living the lives that we so very much love. This plain-looking, ubiquitous material has transformed our built environment the world over. Some find it has a beauty all of its own. It has stood the test of time and survived disasters both natural and man-made. It has stretched our capacity to house ourselves and our industries and workplaces and fills us with a warm sense of security. Without it, every street, every city would look utterly different. Concrete is a great invention. <laughs>